Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Bill and today I'm doing a compiler demo for Odin. This is for version 0.5. So to start off with, um, I'm just going to talk about some of the general stuff that I actually haven't covered, even though this was from ages ago. And some of these aren't ages, some of these I just haven't covered in general. So one of them was complex numbers. Uh, complex numbers are built into the language. So you can just declare them normally, so you can just treat them like a normal number. So if you've got an I at the end of a normal, like, literal, like a number literal, it'll be treated as a complex number. So I, in this case, is the square root minus one, if you know what complex and imaginary numbers are. That's fine. If, if you don't, don't worry. This is just a feature that I wanted in the language, and I thought, look... I think it'd be useful to have as like a core concept in some cases. Um, so again, there's complex 64, which is equivalent to th uh, two F32s built together. And there's a complex 128, which is two F64s built together. You can also declare the complex as, um, this is a built-in uh, procedure, which you can just put the numbers in. If you put a float or something in there, it will also determine what the, the complex then will come out in the end. There's another built-in procedure for it, which is the conjugate, which um, what we'll do, we'll turn, if you do a conjugate of a number, it just turns it to the minus sign there. Again, this is maths, if you want to know, don't worry about that. So if I do build this program, run this up, you get, okay, if you do that number, divide that number, which is that, you get this number. So yay, some could probably just check it out on paper, yeah, you should get the same. And if you just use the built-in procedures here for real and imaginary, um, you can print it out manually as well. Uh, these built-in procedures will work for the complex, uh, sorry, the constant um, e expression system. So you don't have to worry in that sense. It just all works magically. So the next thing I want to show is I'm technically showing off two features here, but I'll come on to talk about what this means. This is a foreign block. So I've now implemented, instead of having, um, I'll put this on another line because it just it's annoying me. Uh, <laughs> The um, So how you declare foreign procedures now is you have a foreign block, or you can just have a foreign tag. So you have the foreign, which is a keyword, the, um, the library it's part of. This is a built-in one in the actual compiler. It's like a hack, because I'm using another one backend, just specifying where it's from. And then you can start the procedure here. So that's how you do it. So you can set the link name here if you want. Eventually, it'll change. the syntax is going to be changed just slightly for the link name. Um, so you can work for variables as well. But I'll talk about this in a bit. But the best thing about it here is you've got C style var args. So this will just work like a C, it will just push it into the stack. But the difference here is that you have extra type safety. So in this case, we have any. So we actually check to see which values you have. You could also, if you just wanted um, one here that only allows int 32s, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Or if it only allowed, um, I don't know, float 32s, whatever, you could something in there and you just force it. So it's better in C that it has extra type safety but um, it works the same as C. So the next little feature I have here is just another built-in procedure, which is expand to tuple. It takes a record, which is like a struct or a union, and expands it into a tuple. So this has the values x, y, and z. Expand it out, and now they're on their own. So you can see here, this has a 1, 2, 3, 0 0.513, and there's a string, you can see there, and you put, put it out, yeah. Um, yeah, and what you can see here is, it's actually, I just realized, is that a bug? That's a bug. Whoops, that is a bug. So what it's done, and I just realised this. Thanks, I found compiler bugs. <laughs> what do you mean, demo? This ain't good. Oh well, is it's got it? It's reordered it for minimal compacting, so it should be the other way around. Oh well, I'll fix that. I'll, that'll be a patch. Whoops. So the next little feature is um, I wanted to be able to say a variable could be an uninitialized, maybe for performance reasons. Like you say, okay, don't worry, I'm going to initialize it later. And all I'm doing is the dash 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 symbol. Um, so this is similar to like nil, which would be the zero value for many types. Um, this is just going to be an undefined value. Just say, hey, this declaration isn't defined. Do not zero it out like by default. The um, other little feature also is the context system, which I use for the allocations and stuff. Um, is now implemented as an implicit parameter passing on procedure calls. Originally, it was a thread local variable, so every thread you had, it would copy it, and the context would actually, it, the, the calls and stuff would make sure it was um, correct. Uh, the problem with that is that it requires, one, it requires to have thread local storage in your system, and some systems do not have that facility. And the other reason is it's a little bit temperamental. 
it, with the passing of an implicit parameter, you can make sure that the um, you can check the previous context of the stack frame. So you can say in this procedure and this context, it's got this context, but if you go back, it's not. But because it's just a, a point you can pass, it's pretty damn cheap. It's just a point you're passing through to each procedure. But if you think even that is costly, you can disable it by changing the calling convention to, let's say, the contextless one, or the C calling convention, or standard, or fast, or whatever, rather than the default, which would be Odin. Um, so there you go. Let's scroll down to scan and see if, uh, examples of foreign blocks. So I told myself to go to uh, Sys Windows. Is another uh, oops, Windows here to show where foreign blocks are. So if I go back down, let's go all the way here. Oops, this is um, you know what? I'm not going to go full screen because it really doesn't like it. Uh, that special full screen is that you've got this. So you gain your foreign block. You've got your foreign library in here. And then you've got all your lovely um, different things here. So you've got the name, the types, and stuff. So you just say, hey, this is part of this library, which was defined all the way up here in the foreign system libraries here. So nice little define. You scroll all the way down. It's now in these blocks. So this is the user 32 ones. This is the GGI 32, um, Shell 32, the Windm, the Windm um, ones. So yeah, it all, it's all pretty, pretty nice. That's how foreign blocks work. Let's go back. So now let's now start with the basis of this cool new feature, which is default arguments. So you can see here's a procedure here which has two default arguments, A and B, and it has values of 9 and 9. Um, so if you print it out, it says um, the first first one here is 1 and 2, so A is 1, B is 2. I change it just to 1, it says A is 1, B is 9, and then do nothing. It says A is 9 and B is 9. So the default values work. Okay, that's not any more clever, all you have to do is just put an equal sign after the value. So let's go a little bit further down first. So the next one is named arguments. So I've just um, added some colors here, so red, orange, green, blue, octarine, whatever. Um, and then there's my email, it's just a little type. So here's like his make a character. And you can put a name and a catchphrase and his favorite color and the least favorite color in there as well. And I'm just in print line. It says, it'll say, my name is whatever. And I like whatever, whatever. Um, so, and it'll just print them out. So if you just do a normal function call like this, you'll say, hey, I'm creating a character called Frank. His catchphrase is, I caramba. Um, and then his favorite color is blue and green. And least color is green. Now, the problem, as I've found in many things, is you may, you sometimes forget what the actual uh, parameter order is. And sometimes the types are the same, so if you swap them accidentally, you may have problems. So, like he says, my name is Frank and I like blue, I carumba. Um, if you've got it accidentally the wrong way around, you can say, my name is I carumba and I like green Frank. Like, like you've got it the wrong way around, but it, there's no syntax error. So, named arguments are a very nice way to kind of disambiguate this. So, I can say, okay, the catchphrase is this. The name is Frank, uh, this is the least favorite color, and this is the favorite color. Um, and I've spelt color wrong. God damn it. I've been with Americans for too long. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> and I spelt favorite wrong? What the flying? Oh, goodness. I've been writing in too much American. It's not great, is it? But yeah, so it's quite useful. And again, the arguments we placed in any particular order. So don't have to worry about that. So here's another one, so it's Octarine, he says catchphrase is what mate? Uh, this colour screen is named Dennis. Now one thing, this is by design, um, is I'm not allowing you to mix named arguments with normal values. I'm not sure if I should in the future, but the reason why I don't is for consistency with um, like type literals. So if I have a, like a struct literal, I don't want you mixing it mainly because it's not predictable like for the user to read, like, okay, which order are these actually going in? And um, it, yes, it may be useful in some particular cases, it just it doesn't look useful. So in this case here, it'll actually just say, it, you cannot mix them. Okay, so this is a mixture of field value and field elements and a procedure is not allowed. So it, it, it clearly just says, don't do that. So the other thing is you can also have named arguments with default values. So here is one little special thing is I don't have to supply the type. I can just say equals like with the var equals here. So um, 
So what you can see here is I can just literally do that. Uh, it, it'll determine the type to be an int, but you can just remove it. I've got optional types. This is like the best string. Uh, you've got faults. This will be this will be again. You've got some constant um, compile time evaluation going here for the constant and another thing here. <coughs> and then it says it says how many? What? Oh, okay. So you can say numerous things. You can just say okay, you just apply the first one in. Great. They're all different ordered. But now I can supply this value, which is named, and this very last one is which is named, and it would work. So you can see, when I run it again, see how many first false, how many second true, which is yeah, fine. So the, the one weird quirk of this syntax is, and I kind of like it weirdly, is that you can place these default values anywhere, not just at the end, like in C plus plus or other languages. You can place them in the middle. Now this may sound like, why the heck would you want to do that? Well, one of the reasons is that you you may have like a, some sort of order like this, and then you may want to just change it. Like I know it sounds daft. It just may be logical at the time to do that. I don't know, but it allows it, and the syntax allows for it. So why not have it? So in this case, this is how many things? Forty-two, huh? And it says how many things? Forty-two, huh? And in this case, now. I'm just going to say prefix and pat, like postman pat, there you go, prefix, prefix. And then it says prefix zero pat, that's great. So there's default argument types. Next now we're going to default return values, which is a little bit even weirder. So now you can set default values again, so you can say first, this here has returns two things, yeah? Um, this one's going to have a default, the first one's going to have a default value of hello. And the second one, which will be a string, which is um, determined here, so like just, it's, it's just inferred. And um, and this one would be, it says world. So, and then when I press, uh, type in foo, I will determine what we're going to return. So in the case of this none, it'll just use both default values. So you just write return. In the case of one, it's only just going to return the first one. In the case of two, it's going to return the first two. Uh, it's going to actually specify the first two. And in the case of three, I'm actually doing the names specifically. Now, these names aren't actually variables. They are just names. These named are, like return values are just names at the end of the day. They don't do anything particularly special. They just have, so you can just refer to them in the return value. And then by default, we just change the last one there. So if we look through here, we're going to say, uh, print the two strings here, and then hit the value from the return value. So foo zero. We'll say, uh, where is it? Where is it? Hello, world. Number one, say goodbye, world. Number two is goodbye, cruel world. Number three is still goodbye, cruel world, but with named arguments. And then number four is hello, my old friend. So there you go. That's pretty simple. Now, this may seem like, why the heck would you ever want to do that? Like, th that just doesn't seem useful. Well, there is a, one thing which I quite like would have, like to have, is this kind of this real world example here. So let's say we've got this, we've got some error value here, and then we've got this type. So we put some function into this value, and then you have two root values. So you have like the nil value, which would be the um, default you'd get, and then um, we're going to have like the value error value here, which is the default, which say it's none. There's no error. So when we go through the case, we can check. Okay, was this six? Okay, was whichever case it was. Oh, this was error. We're going to just set the value of the error value to a specific error, and we've got the default value result. And um, this is one of the reasons why I personally don't like um, like maybe types or like the error union things in many other languages because I have multiple return types. I don't really need it. Like I don't want to. Like fuse the data, I can just separate it. And in this case, it's very clear. Like, look, the error is being set to this, but the default value is nil. Like, you're going to be checking the error value in the end. And then you carry on. So, again, they've got another error. If it doesn't work, the error is still going to be nil, but you're going to set the result explicitly to be that. Yeah? And so that's just, in my opinion, something useful. Okay. So now the other amazing feature. I'm, I'm going quite through this, so just please tell me if I'm going too fast. Um, I've, I've, I've got a lot of features about it, and this is only that third of the way. A bit of busy beaver is what I am. Right. Next thing is call location. Now, I have nicked this idea from um, JI, 
because it's useful and it's I'll explain why in a minute. So, call location. So when you, in many functions you may want to um, provide the location of somewhere in the document, especially maybe the calling location. So if we just check this thing here to begin with, let's say a uh, variable location, there's a built-in procedure which is prefixed with a hash. Uh, this is mainly just to say, look, this is actually a specialized function. It does weird things. Um, it's not just a normal like function. So you can pass it a value, and this value is like the main procedure, wherever this is actually stored. I'll give you the location. So it says main is located at where. So if I scroll down, it says main is located at, and then it will give me this entire um, structure. So it says it, the fully path value is here, the line is there, the column value is there. So it even tells you where the column is of the actual identifier for the main, and then it will tell you where the if if the if it's in a procedure. You can either just not supply it a value at all, and it will just give you the exact position of that call. So it says this line is located at this location, and it tells you what the column is, the line, whatever, and it's in the procedure of call location. So one of the cool things is this will be allow you to have um, tell you where the call site of this procedure is. So if you set a default value using this caller location tag, so if the default value is a call location, you can even set the type to be the uh, source code location if you want it, but you can get rid of the type, it's a bit cleaner. Um, so whenever that function is called, the caller location of that actual call will be passed along. So if we say the amazing three, it says just um, this line here, just ask, which it is, if you look at it, it says um, line, this is down here, you can see it's probably too small, 190 um, column, two, yeah, the second bit, two in just asked to do something amazing. So it says normal, three, amazing is four, oh, amazing. But if you want it to be like, okay, I want to set what the actual um, value is. So you can say, I want actually the call location is actually this procedure here. It says something else like, okay, this call locate, this position here, location, just asked to do something amazing. There you go, there you go. So one of the things why I wanted this is if I've now implemented a cert and panic, they are actually user level functions. They are not built in, they're not built in procedures anymore. So if I look into preload and then type in a cert, this is how a cert is now implemented. Again, it's probably not the best way of implementing a cert, but it, it pretty much works. So you're taking a condition, which is mandatory, and then you can supply it an optional message if you wanted to. By default, it'd be nothing. And then it has a default location, so which is the caller code location. So it says, okay, does the, is the condition fault? Yeah, okay, then it's, it's, it's going to assert. And it's going to do with the debug trap here. And then to print out messages. So if the message is not zero, it's great. Then, then you can have a runtime assertion. Um, and it's the same with, if there is, isn't one, then don't put the message on the end. Same with panic in this case. Panic in this case is very similar to a, a, a cert, but it's all, the condition is always going to be false um, in that case. But it's going to say panic, and I'm going to have debug trap. I like both in this case. It just it means that I have to write something in that case. There you go. So you've got assert and panic. So that's very useful. So now let's go to the very fancy thing, which I actually only implemented about a couple of days ago. It didn't take long. It was just, I was trying to figure out how to do it. And then I was talking to John and it was pretty much like, oh, the most obvious answer is the best way to do it. Okay, I'll speak about that in a minute. So, I've implemented explicit parameter, uh, parametric polymorphic procedures. That is a very big mouthful. A lot of people just say generics. But this is the very specific technical term. Because it is. It's explicit. You're explicitly saying what the types are. And it's parametric because you've got the parameters. It's polymorphic because it will generate new things. And it's a procedure. So, okay, whatever. So, if we look at this procedure here, it's called alloc type. This is identical to new. This is how I actually implement new in preload. So if you look in here and I type in new, it's the same thing. I've just put an inline on the end. So what you do is you have now type here is that the type of this parameter is actually just called type, which is a keyword. So it knows, okay, I'm gonna pass in a type. So if I have an int point here and I create a new type and just pass int, um, you're gonna now 
to further free here as well. I can pass what say that and print it out. You can see it works like here's the pointer and here's the value. So clearly it's been stored. So it works. And they also from before named arguments work as well. So I can say uh, the T equals F32. If I want to be explicit and say, look clearly, I need to show the name, do that as well. And there's another. Another thing is you can actually specify the type here and then you can just use that T, which is you've defined the type everywhere else. So here's a little add function and it'll take a variadic parameters of that parameter and it will just add. So you're going to say add ints and here's a big long list of ints and you add it together. So you do this, you've got one plus two plus two, your big triangle number, you find 21. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's correct. I hope well, the math, math is broken. You could even just do it like a, you could do a rudimentary swap function, which you could do here. So pre-swap is three four, post-swap when you pa when you pass the uh, the pointers in, it will be four three. But again, this is a silly example. In Odin, you'd be doing that syntax. That syntax is what you do for swap, because the right hand side is evaluated before the left hand side, so it will actually do it correctly. So that's hopefully useful, but. You may be thinking, okay, this is not these aren't really ex big examples. Or you, or you might be saying, great, I can see loads of this for it. So let's go down a little bit further and do a little bit more complicated example, which you may actually see in like a real life thing. So if you have like an entity type here, and this is kind of maybe your base type, and you're using sort of like a form of subtyping. So you've got different derived types here, like a rock, a door, a monster, and these are and the base like the the base bit of it is actually a pointer. It's not a uh, like embedded like normal inheritance. So you've got a bed different moment layout. You can have something like this, yeah? So here you go. So in our entity, I should go over here, is we've got a few different things. We've got this derived thing. So this will be the pointer to the derived value, and it's just an any. And that any is very important, so we've got a little bit extra type information going on. So if we scroll down, and we go down all the way down here. Uh, these are just things for the entity manager, so you make sure you've got some extra things going on and whatever. Here's where the special thing goes on. It's called new entity. So you pass in the manager, which is just a pointer, and then the actual explicit type of the entity. And then you can see pass the type and you just returns a pointer of the type. So we're going to declare new of this type. We're going to say the actual base entity is going to get new entity from the manager. Gen or generate new entity from the manager, sorry. Um, and then we're going to set the derived value on that um, entity, which is technically, this is me doing this, but it's it's find out. I'm going to set the data to be that pointer and its type information to be of that type. So now you can actually got extra type information coming from there, which is great. And then whatever. So we can just look at it, some examples here. So here's our manager and here's the big list of entities. So we can say here's a new one, so we can just pass the manager in. We can say it's type, the rock is a rock, and then the positions are X and Y. I don't know why I didn't do that as F32 to begin with. Yeah, probably a reason. Um, but again, as before, named arguments work as well. So you can say that's the manager, and that's the type, that's X and Y. And what's even cooler, especially with this, you may be thinking, okay, the type bit has to be initialized first. The um, compiler actually rearranges it to make sure it is in order. So you can put the type last if you wanted, and it would still work. Like, it would know that it's going to return a type, and it doesn't matter. So even if the type was used in here, like if you had a, um, an array, like, I don't know, of, it, of, of a type in there, it would figure it out. Like, it would know that, oh, yeah, it's fine. And that's pretty cool, because you may want to put something like, I don't know, you may be putting it in any random order. So I'm just going to append all these um, different um, subtypes into the array. And now we're going to go all the way around this. I'm going to go for each array uh, entity in, for each entity in entities. We're going to match it to E as in the entity derived, which was that any, and then do it for each particular case. So we've got rock, door, and monster. So if we look down here, we've got rock equals zero, door equals one, monster equals two. And the portable ID was just the one that was added in. Um, and you can see, it actually knows it, and it's, it's already got the type information. Now, this could be used as an alternative to the union in um, Odin, which I use for uh, like the type information, which is here. And so this is a big union for all the stuff, and it has many of the same advantages. The, the only difference between a union and this like, subtype 
is the memory layout. And the memory layout is, well, a big difference here. Um, so you'd still have a lot of the type safety, but again, with a union, you can just pre-allocate a big chunk of memory and then just each one variant will just use the same block size. While this one, the block size is completely different. Um, so the, the union has the advantage you can just pretty much mem copy it in. It mem copy everyone. It should work unless you've got pointers in it as well. While this version is you can't mem copy because the variants or the subtypes are completely different um, sizes. If that makes any sense. But again, it's one of those um, which do you prefer? And at the end of the day, it is literally which memory layout would you prefer? The. Uh, <laughs> And maybe even got some performance requirements or something, or memory requirements. It, 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 again, it's part of the problem at the end of the day. Um, just to prove that these were the actual things as well, not just got these weird entities. I'm going to put um, EX and EY. And you can see just um, Rock here was 3.5, yeah. Door was uh, 3.6, yeah. And Monster was 2.1. Yeah, that's great. So you did it perfectly correctly then. Yay! So that is pretty much all of the features I've implemented and I've gone through that quite quickly, 26 minutes. Oh, great. So the, oh, the one other minor feature I forgot to ask is I've added one command line argument, which is opt. So if you want optimizations on, you can now put the level on as 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's the same as like most compilers. So if I go to the build bat file, you'll notice I have, I can put um, optimization level. So it's optimization is 0 to nom. Let's say I want it full on 2. And then it'll take a little bit longer because it's trying to optimize it. it yeah, it took an extra two seconds. It is just getting it to be the fastest it can possibly be. And um, we can do three. Um, that's a little bit slower. Optim I think one is... Uh, yeah, one's, again, it's just different things, d different levels. Again, I'm just going to put zero on just so it's fast. And 0 0.6 is slow, in my opinion. It's just it's LLVM, that's what, <laughs> mainly. Um, but yeah, so that's some of the nice new features that I've implemented. So... That is the demo, but I've got some, just before I go on to the question and answers, I don't know, as soon as I can see some in the comments, I've got a few questions to ask myself, uh, like you in general, and where I'm going to be heading with this language. So the first question is, uh, I changed, you notice in the previous demo I said I changed the declaration syntax. So as you can see here, I said I got the keyword of the declaration, then its name. So like the keyword of the declaration, then its name. Um, and this is the style I've been using, I've, I've swapped to, because one, it, it's very consistent, it actually, it's very consistent, and it, it, it's, easy, it's easy to parse and so forth. Um, and the main reason I really changed this, I, f I found JLI to be con inconsistent with itself, like the JLI-like syntax, for declarations at least. And I couldn't find a way around it. One of the big problems was for foreign um, declarations. And foreign declarations seem to only work for procedures. And I needed to implement foreign variables. And I just couldn't get a consistent syntax. And I found the foreign blocks, but again, it wouldn't work um, because you got procedures when if you don't specify that the procedures hasn't got a body like with a foreign tag... Um, <laughs> It just looks like it's a type in the same syntax because the procedure signature is the type of the signature. And if it doesn't have a body, it's just a type. So it's like, how am I going to solve that problem? And I just couldn't do it. I was, so I thought, screw it. I think every other language must have been right. They must have done this prefix style. Silly old me had to go solve that problem yesterday. And I was like, oh, whoops. So my question is, should I go back? And the way I solved it is just you put that uninitialized value at the end of it and say, look, you've got the, the body is defined elsewhere. That's what it means. Like, look, you've got a body that's def defined elsewhere. You've now solved it. You're saying this is a literal without a body, not just its type. So the question is, which do people prefer? The JI like syntax, which is more like infix rather than prefix, um, or go with the, the Pascal style, which is the prefix style. I say Pascal, I, most modern languages like Rust and um, uh, Ada and Nim and stuff use that as well, but and Go, and Go technically, yeah. Um, so you have JLI, -like, which is like, you have the name, uh, the colon, which is the type separator, the type, which may be optional, and then the value, which is on the, the right. Um, 
so that's it so the jr it, it all works and it literally this is the only way i had to solve it i had to solve it was just that damn little thing it was an indicator to say this is a procedure literal not a procedure type and you may be arguing but why don't you just say if it's inside of a foreign block you just assume it's a literal well the main problem is knowing me and i know i will do this i'm copying blocks of code and i'll accidentally put a type in there and then it'll be acting as if it's not a type and it's like whoops I know I'd be able to catch it, but it's like, it's knowing me, I want that extra redundancy as well, and I want that extra clarity, like, clearly, this is a procedure literal, this is not a procedure type. And that's it. So, at the end of the day, it's deciding between the two. Um, for me, personally, changing it is just an afternoon's work. It's just a full-on afternoon's work, but it's not... It's not that much of a problem. They both are about, I'd say, on par with each other now. They are, they are. This the Pascal style has some lovely advantages. Like you can just um, group them and say, look, here's a big block of these dec declarations. Um, you can just, you can, I can show you again in the preload. You can see I've got a big declaration of types here. Um, where's another one? Uh, duh, 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 duh. But you can't. Uh, where is another one? Yeah, another declaration of grouping of types. So hey, these are all types. There will be a group grouping of variables elsewhere um go to OpenGL is a good one like uh, here you go big grouping of variables and you clearly they're variables going they're not procedures anymore um and so on like that you can just group things together another one is the OpenGL constants which is just a big block of const it's clear to it it is similar to like uh, pascal but with the JAI syntax, you wouldn't need to do that because it's so short, the syntax is. Like, it's just colon, colon. Again, it's just one of those why I don't know. Um, other than that, the future things in the future, I haven't wrote on here in, it, in, in general, is I want to implement is the implicit uh, parametric polymorphism. So if I go to the explicit bit, I want the ability to write this add function by having, I don't want you to explicit, have to explicitly write the type. I can just say he can infer the type from the parameter. So if you pass an int, you say, okay, this is clearly going to be an int. Set all the rest, every other case. So it'll be the implicit, and this would be really good for many cases. One of them would be, the thing I'd use all the time would be like sorting functions and stuff like that, like, or maybe even like other generic um, functions. Um, but yeah, that's one of them. The other one is also on parametric polymorphic types. So I want to say, hey, I want to generate a matrix. I pass in these numbers, these types. Great. I'll also want to be able to, like, the ability to bake them so I can um, say, okay, this can be aliased or this could be this parameter. There's so many things once you go down this rabbit hole, what you can do. And you kind of need to do that. Uh, one of the things I was working on and got distracted when I was implementing this, I was Im implementing the documentation system. So I want to be able to generate documentation from just an Odin file, just from the literally from the comments on the code. And say, so, okay, here's all the here's all the code, here's all the, the specialness to it, and they look. Here we go. There, there is the type. There is the um, here's the like the declaration. Here's the comment that explains it and stuff. And it just looks like normal code. I, I wanted a generalized one that works for everyone, not just special ones like you need doxygen or whatever like on that top. Just have a gen the built-in one and make it work. Uh, the uh, the other things I'm implementing are I need to and I want an attribute system and a tagging system, so maybe similar to C Sharp, but maybe just simp slightly simpler as well. Just so you can in, you can query your own code is the best way of doing it. Like find all the things that tagged with this, find all the stuff that has these sort of things and the extra data stored with it. Uh, the other thing um, is getting the metaprogramming working, which is also tied to getting it replacing the back end from. Um, replacing the back end from LLVM and having a custom one. Because when you do the metaprogram, that would just be in case, like both of them. Um, LLVM is slow, and I'd love a very, very quick one. Even if it's not optimized, I want a quick pass phase. And if you want to go back to the LLVM thing, you should be able to choose that. It would be just like a command line argument or something. Or it'll be the, in the metaprogram system, whatever. So that is it. Um, thank you for listening to me ramble on and show some of this cool stuff um i'm just going to take a literally like a minute break and then i'll get the questions ready for me please if you've got any questions about what you've just seen so thank you